Thank you, Jamel. Thank you, worship team, for that time of offering up our praises and worship. We continue our time of worship now with hearing the Word of God and asking what it is that God, how God would have us respond, how He would, would challenge us and comfort us with His Word today. Uh, I asked the children, how should a king look and how does a king look? Um, I want to broaden the question a little bit and ask you, how do you want those who represent you in some way to look? Um, a couple of years ago, I had the wonderful opportunity to be in a musical. Uh, I got to be in Fiddler on the Roof. And I got to, it was a, a wonderful experience for a lot of reasons. But one of the most fun things to do was that I got to grow out my beard really big. Uh, I got cast in the musical in November, and then the musical was in February. So my beard was probably about like this, maybe a little fuller in November. As I went into audition, I thought, I probably need to trim my beard. And then the audition process came up, and I thought, I'm going to leave it. And then so from November to February, so whatever you're imagining, it was better than that. It was, a, it was an impressive beard. I miss it sometimes. It was like a friend. But Jenny, uh, there was, uh, as we were getting closer to the play and the beard kept getting bigger and bigger, there was one day I was going to take the children to the park. And I was dressed in jeans and a hoodie and a baseball cap, just normal clothes. And Jenny said, you can't take the children to the park looking like that. I said, looking like what? She said, people are going to call the police on you. They're going to think there's a, a sketchy looking man hanging out at the playground with the children. I, I was not representing her well, I thought. I thought it looked great. Uh, well, you may have had this experience as your children are going out to school. You say, are you going to wear that to school or perhaps church? Are you wearing that to church? You, you are representing me. Uh, we have all had this experience with whatever our favorite team is. Whatever our favorite sports team is, we are rooting for them. We feel involved somehow in what they are doing, and they do not represent us well. It just, they, they just they let us down, and they look bad doing it. It's one thing if you struggle and just don't quite overcome, but if you just tank, oh, that's the worst. Because how they look, how the people who represent us look, we feel, says something about us. And if we're talking about a king, if we're talking about our leader, our ruler, our lord, we, what do we want them to look like? We want them to look glorious. We want them to look invulnerable. Maybe we want them to be also approachable and merciful. But that's a side benefit to them being glorious and invulnerable, unconquerable. And if they're merciful and kind, well, that's just a bonus. Uh, we maybe even want them to struggle a little bit. The, our Lord, our King, our, our, uh, uh, our Master. But maybe there's a challenge that they have to overcome and it looks like for a moment that they're not going to be able to do it and then they do and they pull through and it just adds to their glory. But what we never want, the people who represent us to look as defeated, demoralized, we never want them to look ridiculous because if they can be ridiculed, if they can be mocked, then it means that in some sense we're being ridiculed and we're mocked. If they're ridiculous, then we're ridiculous for rooting for them. If they're ridiculous, then we're ridiculous for loving them. Now, with that in mind, let's look at Luke chapter 23, verse 33 through 43. When they came to the place called the skull, there they crucified him, that's Jesus, and the criminals, one on the right and the other on the left. But Jesus was saying, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they, the soldiers, cast lots, dividing up his garments among themselves. And the people stood by looking on. And even the rulers of the Jews were sneering at him, saying, He saved others. Let him save himself, if this is the Christ, the Messiah, the Anointed One of God, his Chosen One. The soldiers also mocked him, coming up to him, offering him sour wine, and saying, If you are the King of the Jews, save yourself. And there was also an inscription above it, This is the King of the Jews. One of the criminals who were hanged there was hurling abuse at him or blaspheming, saying, Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other answered and rebuking him said, Do you not even fear God, since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? We indeed are suffering justly, for we are receiving what we deserve for our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. And he was saying, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. 
And Jesus said to him, Truly I say to you, today you shall be with me in paradise. We've jumped into the middle of the story, obviously. The night before this happens, the morning of Good Friday, Jesus has been betrayed by one of the people that was closest to him. Jesus has been tried on false charges or trumped up charges before the Sanhedrin, the Jewish Supreme Court, the rulers and the religious leaders of the Jews who had the authority uh, granted to them by the Romans to try official Jewish matters. And they find Jesus worthy of death, but they don't have the authority to put Jesus to death. So they have to take him up the food chain. They send him to Herod, who is the puppet king of the Jews. But Jesus won't say anything to Herod. And so he gets sent to Pilate, who's the governor, the Roman governor, the man who's really in charge. And Pilate, not because he thinks he's guilty, but because he wants to throw the Jews a bone, uh, condemns Jesus to death. So Jesus has been tried on false charges three times and condemned to death. And so now he is led to the place of the skull. In Aramaic, it's Golgotha. In Latin, uh, the skull is Calvary. Uh, that's where the name comes from, the place where Jesus died. What is happening here is really not that unusual. This is the story that we know of crucifixion, but every Jewish person living in Jerusalem would have had a story of crucifixion. Not of their own, but of somebody that they knew. Some relative, some friend, somebody that they knew who had been crucified by the Romans. The Romans, anytime there was even a hint, even a whiff of rebellion, would crucify people in mass. The town next door to Jesus' town, probably about the time that Jesus was a teenager, had the entire population of that town crucified because there was the rumor that they were going to rebel against Rome. Everybody knew somebody who knew somebody. If they, if they didn't know somebody personally, they knew somebody who knew somebody who had been crucified. So the Romans doing this was not out of the ordinary. They did this often. What makes it different is that it's Jesus being crucified. And what Jesus did and who Jesus said he was, that's what makes the difference. In Luke's gospel, the people who are crucified on either side of Jesus are called criminals. We'll come back to that. They're called different things in the, in the gospels. In Matthew and Mark, they're called robbers or highwaymen might be a uh, translation. You know highwaymen? Uh, people that you get the idea of somebody hiding in the bushes and as somebody is crossing by on the road, they jump out and rob them and possibly kill them. In John, the Gospel of John, John just calls them men. Uh, and it's one of the ways that it reveals the different emphases of the Gospel authors. For Matthew and Mark, the robbers represent the kind of people that Jesus was lumped in with. Jesus is thrown into this group along with people that jump out in the bushes and rob people. But it also, you also have to consider the circumstances. The kind of places where you most often find highwaymen where you most often find people hiding along the highways to jump out and rob people, are places where there's some disagreement about who's in charge. Uh, places where either the government is weak or places where uh, there are rebels uh, and there's conflict and, and so though people watch the roads to try and, and waylay people. And this makes sense given the state of Israel being ruled over by the Romans. It's possible, although the Gospels don't say this exactly, that these highwaymen, that these robbers thought of themselves in some way as revolutionaries. That they were out to defeat the Romans in whatever small way that they could. Uh, highwaymen did not rob poor people, they robbed rich people. And so they very likely thought of what was going on in Israel as a conflict between us regular people like us and the elite people, the rich people, the people that are in the pocket of Rome. And we're going to get in their pockets and take what belongs to them. And so for Matthew and Mark, Jesus is lumped in with them. These are people that are standing in the way or trying in some way to overturn the power of Rome or the power of the, the people that are holding power in Israel. In John, the emphasis is on their humanity. These are men crucified with Jesus. Uh, it makes sense given John's Gospel's emphasis on what Jesus has done and its meaning for the whole world and for all of humanity. But in Luke, they're criminals. And the word specifically refers to people who have done something evil. And Luke does not specify what it was that they did. If they, uh, you, you can imagine the sort of things that highwaymen, robbers, would have been up to, uh, stealing and killing. Uh, even if they felt in some way justified in themselves to do it, it's still morally wrong. 
And so for Luke, the emphasis, on the, moral, the emphasis is on the moral difference. These are men who have done something wrong. No matter what law you're under, stealing and killing is wrong. But especially in Israel, you know, ignore what the Romans want. God has commanded, you shall not steal, you shall not murder. And so what these men have done is wrong. And Jesus is not. And in this situation, betrayed, tried on false charges, condemned to death, placed between two people that are guilty, while he in the middle is not. Jesus says something that just, that still, after all these years of following Jesus, just staggers me. Luke 33, 34, 23, 34. Jesus was saying, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. I'm going to do something a little unusual here in a sermon and just stop there and ask you to think about that silently for a minute. Not a whole minute, a couple of seconds, but it'll feel like a long time because we don't normally have silence in sermons. But I'm going to say it again. I just want you to reflect on that for a minute. Betrayed, tried on false charges, condemned to death. Jesus was saying, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. It just runs the total opposite direction from everything in our natural instinct. Betrayed, tried on false charges, condemned to death, having done nothing wrong. Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And because it runs absolutely backwards to what our natural instinct tells us that we should feel and we should ask and what we would ask in that circumstance, it tells us that we're dealing with something supernatural. We're dealing with something that goes beyond humanity and gets into the heart of who God is and what it is that God wants. Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. The next thing that happens after Jesus' prayer is that the soldiers divide up his clothes among them. If that strikes us as strange, uh, remember in the ancient world that clothing was wealth. There are many places uh, when wealth is being calculated uh, in the Old Testament and the New Testament that clothing is mentioned as, as part of what you belong to. Uh, people, most people then, uh, people of Jesus' social status, would have had one article of clothing, or two articles of clothing, an, an inner tunic and an outer tunic. And that's what they're gambling for. Because he's not going to need them anymore. And it's something that is available. And so the soldiers gamble for it. It also fulfills a prophecy from the Psalms. And what this amounts to, in them gambling for what Jesus has, the only things that Jesus really had on him uh, are them taking everything that he had left. Anything that Jesus might have given to anyone, that's it. And they've taken it. Uh, it's theirs, their price uh, that they take for themselves. And then, something that the Bible, that the Gospel does not specifically spell out, but I think I'm on pretty solid ground in saying this. Several chapters earlier, after Jesus has been baptized by John the Baptist, he goes out in the wilderness to be tempted. Uh, or he goes out in the wilderness to spend time with God, and then he gets, gets tempted while he's out there. Uh, when Jesus is tempted, and Jesus resists the devil's temptation, Luke, in his recording of the event, adds an ominous little verse that says, The devil left him until a more opportune time. There's no other place in the Gospels where Jesus encounters the devil. But this, a similar sort of temptation, I think, occurs here, at this moment, at Jesus' lowest moment. And again, it happens three times. I think this is the time. Uh, people who work with, with people going through addiction uh, have described, uh, used the word HALTS, the acronym HALTS, to describe when is temptation most going to strike you? to do something that you know that you do not need to do. Uh, halts, hungry, angry, lonely, tired, and stressed. So the temptation in the wilderness certainly fits all those categories, but so does this moment when Jesus is betrayed on the cross. Hungry is probably the least of his worries right now. It was at the top of the list when he was in the wilderness, having not eaten for 40 days. But here, even though he hasn't eaten since the night before, this is probably on the, the lowest end of what he's worried about. Angry? I think that's fair to say. This is the Jesus who cries out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? 
That sounds a little angry to me. Lonely? All of his friends who said they would go with him to death have deserted him. John, we know from John's Gospel, may be in the background here, but everybody else, everybody that said they would stay with him to death is gone, hiding, trying to save their own lives. Tired after being tortured, after being mocked, after staying up all night and enduring all that? Yes. Stressed? Yes. All of those things are the perfect recipe for a time of temptation. And in this time of temptation, the rulers of the Jews, the people who brought him to trial, the people who were responsible for putting him through all this, come to him and say, He saved others. Let him save himself, if this is the Christ of God, his chosen one. And they use those titles on purpose, and they must have had venom in their voice when they said it. If he is the Christ, if he's the Messiah, if he's the anointed one, he thinks he's the next David, let's see something. Let's see him defeat Goliath. Let's see him defeat what is, what, what is brought up against him. He thinks he's the one that God has chosen to accomplish God's will. What did they think God's will would have been? My guess is that they would have thought, he thinks he's the one who's going to kick the Romans out of here. He thinks he's the one that's going to flip the power differential upside down and put us on top and the Romans on the bottom. He's the one that's going to set things right. That's going to call people to do what it is that God wants them to do. That's what they expected the Messiah to do. He's, he's the one who, who thinks he's going to free Israel from oppression. He's the one who's going to put the downtrodden back on top. He's the one who's going to bring back the old days but make them better than the old days. Make them better than ever. And to them, at this moment, the idea that this man could do that is ridiculous. And so they mock him. Because he's crucified. How could it be possible that this man would do those things? Temptation number one. He saved others. Let him save himself. The soldiers also mocked him, coming up to him, offering him sour wine, and saying, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. And they're the ones who nailed the inscription above the cross. That's their mockery. And the second temptation. You think you're stronger than the Roman Empire? That's ridiculous. You deserve to be made fun of. The idea that you could resist Roman power. You grew up seeing people crucified. And you thought you could escape this fate by going up against Rome and claiming to be the king of the Jews? Rome has a king. Uh, sorry, e Israel has a king. They have a puppet king named Herod. Herod and Caesar were buddies. Uh, and, and Caesar, as a favor to Herod, made Herod king of the Jews. But he's not really the king of the Jews. That's just sort of a pat on the head from the real king of the Jews, who is Caesar. Caesar is Lord. It said it on the money. I mean, it, was, it wasn't a question for anyone, and it wasn't a question for the Romans. King of the Jews? Ha! Look at you. Crucified. Ridiculous. And then this ironic charge, the king of the Jews, that's the condemnation of a rebel. You call yourself the king of the Jews. Let, me, let us illustrate to you and everybody watching who the real king of the Jews is, and it's who we take our orders from. We, the Roman soldiers. It's Caesar who's the real king of the Jews. It's also worth noting that the Jewish leaders, who in their heart of hearts really wanted the Romans out and themselves in charge, were totally willing to go along with the power that they hated in order to keep things as they were, rather than change in a way that they didn't want to change. Uh, they didn't want Jesus leading the revolution. They wanted somebody they were in control of, perhaps, leading the revolution, but not him. So they were willing to cooperate with the people that they hated so that things wouldn't change in a way they didn't want to change. And then the final temptation comes from that first criminal. Are you not the Christ, the Messiah, the Anointed One? Save us. Save yourself and us. Three temptations. The same thing. Save yourself. Get yourself out of this. And then we'll believe. Save yourself. Prove it to us in this moment that you are who God says you are, that you are who you claim to be. The second criminal says something a little different. He's not talking about messiahs. He's not talking about salvation, necessarily. This is his confession. He knows that Jesus is guiltless. Whatever it is that they have done, they deserve. They, should, they expected that. They could have, very likely would have expected this. 
as a reward for the things that they had done. But he doesn't deserve this. And so that criminal expects that Jesus will receive a reward. He will receive a kingdom. Maybe not the kingdom that the Jewish rulers were hoping for. Maybe not the, the kingdom that the Roman soldiers think they're a part of. But he's got something coming from God. You will receive a kingdom. And he asked Jesus, will you include me in your kingdom? He knows that because Jesus is innocent and suffering innocently, that God will reward him. And he, and he asks to be part of that reward, even though he doesn't deserve it. Jesus deserves it. This criminal does not, but he still asks to be included. And Jesus' promise to him is, today, you will be with me in paradise. It's not a word that's used a lot in the Bible. The idea is to be in the presence of God. That's what makes paradise, paradise. You will be with me today in the presence of God. You are included because you have believed something about me that the other people around have not believed. Let's go back to the question. Who do we want to represent us? What do we want them to look like? What do we want them to do? What kind of king do we want? I'm going to go in reverse order of those that said, save yourself and us if you are the Son of God. The first criminal's mistake. Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. What kind of king do we want? What do we wish God would do for us personally instead of believing in and following Jesus? Are we holding out something that we're waiting on God to do before we'll trust it, before we'll believe in it? What's our wish list for God? What have we said to God? What have we said to Jesus? Prove yourself to me. Prove yourself. Are you God or not? Are you here or not? Are you listening or not? Are you Savior or not? If you are, then get me out of this, and then we'll see. That's a rather arrogant way to approach God, don't you think? A rather arrogant way for this criminal to approach Jesus. Save yourself and us. But we need to ask ourselves the question, is that how we are approaching our King? Is that how we are approaching God? This is my wish list, and if you will check all these things off, then we'll see about me following you. And God does not, I think, honor much, <laughs> honor many who approach him in that way. The soldier's mistake goes a little broader. It's not just about personal desire. The soldier's mistake is, if you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. Our question, the question for us, what kind of king do we want, who do we want to represent us is, where do we look for power and strength? Where do we look for power and strength to save us, to preserve us, to make our life what it's intended to be instead of Jesus? Who, do, who or what do we trust to preserve and protect and save rather than Jesus? What do we consider to be really safe? What are our conditions for us to feel safe, for us to feel protected, for us to feel successful? What will really, let's get down to the nitty gritty, what will keep us from being mocked? What will keep us from being ashamed? What will keep us from being ridiculous? You can look around the world, the world, the culture around us, and you can see what most people trust to protect us from being mocked and ashamed is power, money, reputation, other people's reputation. We spend a lot of time managing other people because we're worried about their reputation reflecting on us. What really protects us? What really keeps us safe? Let's put it this way. How do we keep the loser stink off of us? Uh, you know, the loser stink, when, when somebody is a loser, we don't want to be associated with people that are losers. And so how do we, what boundaries do we set up to keep the losers away and make ourselves look like a winner? And does that have anything to do with what Jesus has commanded us to do to follow him and to be faithful to what he's commanded us? The Sadducees' mistake goes even broader than that. What do we wish God would do for us, us being not just me personally, but people like us? What do we wish God would do for our people instead of our people asking, what is it that Jesus wants us to do? Us as the group we belong to. The group that we assume that that group's goals are probably God's goals. So we'll just go with that. I'm going to read you a quote from Walter Brueggemann. Brueggemann is an Old Testament scholar. But uh, in this quote, he reflects on the church and the culture around us. He said, I believe the crisis in the U.S. church has almost nothing to do with being liberal or conservative. 
It has everything to do with giving up on the faith and discipline of our Christian baptism and settling for a common generic U.S. identity that is part patriotism, part consumerism, part violence, and part affluence. That's wealth. That's the quote. Let me read it again. I believe the crisis in the U.S. church has almost nothing to do with being liberal or conservative. It has everything to do with giving up on the faith and discipline of our Christian baptism and settling for a common generic U.S. identity that is part patriotism, part consumerism, part violence, and part affluence. What do we really think will keep us safe? What do we really think we owe our allegiance to? Who is really worthy to represent us? That's the question. The Sadducees were willing to use Roman power to get this Jesus who preached and modeled forgiveness out of the way. Because the Sadducees wanted ideally them or somebody they controlled to be on top. They did not want to share a table with their enemies. And Jesus in word and deed kept telling them that that's what they needed to do. And they didn't want to do that. So they had to get that out of the way. What are we looking for in a king? Who do we want to represent us? I want to point out something that I, I just realized recently about the second criminal's confession. And it goes back to what Jesus said at the beginning as he was being crucified. Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And the second criminal says, We are indeed suffering justly, for we are receiving what we deserve for our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. Everybody else in this passage wants something from Jesus. They want Jesus to prove something to them. The second criminal, and we don't know his name, the second criminal is the only one who recognized that he needed what Jesus was offering in that moment. Father, forgive them. And the second criminal is the only one who knew that he needed that. Everybody else thought they needed something else. They needed uh, for Jesus to prove to, him, to them who he was. They needed for Jesus to show that he had more power than the Roman Empire. They needed Jesus to get them out of that situation. But this man knew that he needed forgiveness. And he just heard Jesus asking God for it. This, this man was the only one that recognized that he needed what Jesus had to offer. He recognized his own fault. And he recognized Jesus' innocence. He believed that Jesus would receive a reward of some sort. And he trusted Jesus to be merciful enough to include him if he asked. And Jesus did. On the cross, all without seeing the resurrection, all without seeing what God would do next, he believed that because Jesus was innocent, that Jesus deserved a reward, and because Jesus was merciful, that if he asked, Jesus would share that reward with him. Brothers and sisters, we stand on the other side of the resurrection, on the other side of the moment when God raised Jesus from the dead and said, that sign that you put up on the cross that you thought was a joke was true. And I've proved it to you by raising him from the dead. I have canceled your crucifixion. I have canceled your execution. You're, you've heard of a last minute stay of execution. Well, this is after the last minute. That execution was wrong. It was wrong to happen. And so I've reversed it. And not only have I reversed his execution, I've reversed death for all who will put their faith in him. He deserves a reward. And the reward he gets is resurrection from the dead and lordship over the earth. And if you'll put your faith in him, if you'll recognize that you need forgiveness, and if you will trust Him to be merciful enough to give it to you if you ask, then He will let you share, not only in His, for, in his reward, but in His resurrection and in His kingdom. And He'll say to you, today, on the day you die, you will be with me in the presence of God. This man believed it all without seeing the resurrection, but we stand on the other side. And we believe not only in being in the presence of God, but in new creation, that Christ will return and set all things right, that there will be a new heaven and a new earth. Step one is to recognize that we need what he is offering. Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they, is, what, what, do not know what they are doing. Hey, that's me. <laughs> I don't know what I'm doing. And the things that I've done that, that are the worst, and even, even the little bit that I've recognized how bad they are, I probably haven't recognized how bad they are. I have not known what I was doing. And I need forgiveness. Step one is recognize our need. Step two is accept what he offers. He offers forgiveness to those who will put their faith in Him. Not because we deserve it, but because He is gracious and merciful. Because He loves us. Step one, recognize our needs. Step two, accept what He offers. And step three, accept no substitutes. 
for Jesus as king. Follow him in obedience. And that gets us to the trickiest part. How good are you at doing two things at once? Humor me for a second. Everybody pat your tummy. You can choose which hand. Pat your tummy and now rub your head. Well, some, no, I can't, I, I can't do it and preach at the same time. Hold on. Rub my head and pat my, okay, okay. I can't do three things at once. Here's the tricky part. You've got to do two things at once. You have to believe in Jesus' ultimate victory in our lives and in the world. And we have to follow Jesus' pattern for how he achieved that victory. Jesus did not achieve that victory by hearing the Sadducees and the soldiers and the criminal next to him prove yourself, save yourself, show us something. And then Jesus snapping his fingers and standing whole and resurrected before them. It's not how it happened. He had to endure the will of God. He had to endure suffering on behalf of those who hated him to get to the point of resurrection. Jesus' pattern, the thing he tells his disciples to do, is to follow him in self-sacrifice. Follow him in giving of their lives for the sake of others. The Son of Man did not come to, uh, to receive glory, but to give his life as a ransom for many. And because he does that, he receives glory. But it doesn't go in reverse. This is how the, our king achieves victory. Going through that point where everybody pointed at him and laughed at him and ridiculed him. Going through that point where it seemed like a defeat. Going through that point where it seemed like he could, they couldn't be true. And getting through that and getting to the other side and being rewarded by God. This is the path that he walked. This is the pattern that he puts out for his subjects. This is not a message that really excites people. <laughs> we, would, we like it because of the sort of message that promises us guaranteed victory. And the truth is that it does come with guaranteed victory. But the path that's laid out to get there is the path of service, the path of sacrifice, the path of self-sacrificial love, the path of something that may be even harder than that, the path of forgiveness, of forgiving those that have done us wrong and asking God to forgive them. That's the path that our king has laid out before us. That's the rule of his kingdom, is forgiveness, self-sacrificial love, and faithfulness unto death. Got to do two things at once. Obey what he commands us to do. Love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. Forgive those who have, you, you have something against. Take up your cross daily and follow me. Be ready to sacrifice yourself for the needs of those you love. And be faithful unto death. The one who follows me unto death will receive a reward. Follow that pattern. But believe, this is the second thing, believe that that is the path of victory. Victory over sin. Victory over death. Victory over evil. Not just in our lives, but in the world. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for what Jesus endured for us, for each of us as individuals, for the church as his body, for the world as the world that you made and that you love and that you are trying to redeem. Heavenly Father, I pray for any who have not recognized their need today, that you would help them to see their need for forgiveness. Heavenly Father, I pray that you would help them to accept Jesus' offer of forgiveness by putting their faith in him and trusting him as their Lord and as their Savior by believing that he died on the cross for them and rose from the dead. And Heavenly Father, for those of us who have believed, who have been believers maybe for a long time, I pray, Lord, that you would reveal to us where we have settled for something less than following Jesus as King. Help us to repent of those things that we have trusted in that are not of you. And help us, God, to be obedient to what you command us to do, to forgive, to offer self-sacrificial love, to be faithful even unto death. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.